All right, we continue with our series, uh, Understanding and Obeying the uh, Ten Commandments, uh, this uh, series for small group uh, study. We're in uh, lesson number five, and we're going to cover the fourth commandment, and the title of this lesson is The Sabbath Rest. Well, let's begin uh, by reading uh, the passage upon which the commandment is based, and that would be uh, the, the fourth commandment is based, and that would be in Genesis chapter two, verses two and three. Genesis two says, by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And the first thing we need to uh, understand here is that God didn't rest in the sense that uh, he was tired, he needed a rest. Here the word rest means to cease, to cease his work. He stopped creating. This is the idea. So Sabbath means cessation or rest. Uh, it was blessed in the sense that no further creation was done. The uh, creation stood in its glory, giving honor to God by its very existence. So we go forward now to Exodus chapter 20, verse eight, where the commandment uh, is written, and it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, the purpose of the uh, command was to give God's people a specific time to worship God, a time to renew the soul as well as the body, a time to permit the worship of God without the pressure of, of work. Uh, this was a new concept socially. This was a new social concept. No other group, no other uh, uh, religious group, no other culture had this as part of their uh, religious observance. Uh, Jewish worship uh, was complex and time consuming, and this command allowed the time to perform it and to perform it well. No work was permitted on this day. Uh, only uh, the caring for the sick, uh, priestly functions, uh, the rescue of endangered livestock was uh, permitted. Now, by New Testament times, when Jesus appeared some 1400 years after the command was given, this particular command had become more of a curse uh, than a blessing. Instead of uh, a simple day of worship without the pressure of work, the rabbis, uh, who were the teachers or experts in the law, had created so many complications for the no work rules that the pleasure and purpose of the day was almost lost completely. Uh, there were 39 different categories of things that constituted work and thus were prohibited. For example, uh, a tailor uh, could not carry his needles home from work uh, on the Sabbath day. That was considered work. Or you couldn't walk further than a certain distance um, from your home because walking further than that would be considered work and thus uh, breaking the Sabbath day. And so this type of legalism bred a, a counter legalistic mindset uh, in order to get around the rules. You know. uh, for example, a person would walk you know, the distance that was permitted uh, on the Sabbath day uh, while wearing his sandals, and then once he got to the limit of where he could walk, he would remove his sandals and continue to walk barefoot, and in that way uh, think that uh, he was not breaking the rule about uh, the distance a person could walk on the Sabbath day. So uh, of course, uh, add, uh, you know, this adding of rules and resistance to compliance to the rules uh, missed the central idea behind the command. The fourth commandment was given because God wanted man to honor him with his time, with his time. The first four commands deal with how man honors God. Number one, to honor God by making him first. Number two, to honor God by lifting him above all else. Number three, to honor God with our lips. And number four, the fourth commandment, to honor God with our time. We measure our existence in terms of time. This command required man to honor God with the currency of his existence, which was time. 
And so the Sabbath enabled man to channel his time away from work and business and devote that time to God. Man needs sleep, for example, and food and exercise, but man also needs the time to worship God. It's part of his design. Our sinful fleshly nature tends to work and play rather than worship. And so this command was given to help man keep that healthy balance between what is physical and what is spiritual. In addition to this, God's perfect and holy nature demanded a response from His creation, and that response is worship. The command reveals and guarantees that man will receive the blessings of the worship that he offers to God. Now, one question, uh, or for some groups, challenge, is why Christians observe Sunday as their day of worship and not Saturday as the fourth commandment required of the Jews. The, the short answer to this is that God himself has revealed to us in a variety of ways that Sunday was to be the special day of worship for Christians in the New Testament era. Jesus through his apostles has given us this teaching and he has a right to do so because as he said, he is the Lord of the Sabbath, Matthew chapter 12, verse eight. Jesus rules the Sabbath and he directs us to worship him on Sundays since his resurrection. You know, we know this from many, uh, many different sources. First of all, uh, Sunday was the day that God chose for his resurrection. Could have been any other day, but he chose Sunday for that time. Read about that in uh, Mark chapter 16, verse nine. Secondly, uh, it was the day that uh, he established the church. You know, in Acts chapter two, verses uh, one, all the way to the end of Acts, uh, we read about Pentecost uh, Sunday. Uh, Pentecost was um, a feast that was celebrated 50 days from the Passover Saturday. It's how we know that Pentecost was on a Sunday, seven weeks plus a day, Pentecost. And Pentecost Sunday was also the day that the apostles received power from the Holy Spirit. He empowered them, right? They began speaking in tongues and preaching the gospel on Pentecost Sunday. It was the day that the gospel was first proclaimed. Peter stood up among the apostles and they began preaching the gospel on Pentecost Sunday. And on that day, 3000 people were baptized and all of them received uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit on that day. Uh, there is no significant act or blessing that occurred on a Saturday after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, another reason um, that we know that Sunday is the day that, the, uh, that Christians uh, set aside for worship is that uh, Sunday was the first day that the Lord's Supper was shared after the resurrection of Jesus. We read about that in Acts chapter two, verse 42, where Luke writes that the, uh, the disciples continued in the apostles' teaching, uh, in fellowship, in prayer, the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread was the, uh, uh, was the way that they described the communion. So the communion, uh, sharing the Lord's Supper began on, uh, the, Lord's, uh, on the Lord's day, on, on Sunday, and it continued to be on that day, in other words, sharing the communion continued to be done on Sundays. We read about that in Acts chapter 20, verse seven. And perhaps another reason, uh, it is the day which Jesus selected his name be associated with. We read in Revelation chapter 110, John says that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The, the Lord's day wasn't Friday or Wednesday or Saturday, the Lord's day was Sunday. It was understood by the apostles and the early Christians that the Lord's day, that day was Sunday. And it's on that day that they took the communion, that they gathered for worship and so on and so forth. Now, there are some that argue that we should keep the Sabbath. Even uh, there are religious organizations built around this idea, Seventh-day Adventists, for example, and other Sabbatarian groups. Uh, they have many arguments supporting their ideas, and I thought maybe it'd be a good time to talk about some of these uh, briefly and, um, and provide some responses. So here are some of the arguments you know, um, that people make uh, in order to keep the Sabbath as the day uh, that we worship. Uh, one of the arguments is that the Pope 
uh, one of the Catholic popes changed the true worship day, which was Saturday, uh, to Sunday, and therefore Sunday is not a legitimate day, kind of a conspiracy idea. Well, it is true that Constantine, the emperor, made um, an edict or a law making Sunday the official worship day in the Roman Empire. However, Christians were worshiping on Sunday long before it was made into law. It's not like that was something new. That was something that was codified, if you wish, in the Roman Empire, but the, the early church worshiped on Sunday from the, from the very beginning. So this was not the introduction of anything that had not already been done and blessed uh, and authorized by the apostles themselves. Another argument, um, the Ten Commandments are God's word and they're not to be changed. That's including the fourth commandment about the Sabbath. Well, the New Testament shows that this premise is incorrect. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse seven and eight, uh, Paul says that the law was ultimately to be done away with. You know, Christians are not under law. We're not under the law, we're under grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul refers to the law which was abolished in his own lifetime, he says. In Matthew 5, 18, it says that the law remained in force until all would be fulfilled and all was fulfilled at the cross. Colossians chapter two, verse 14. Don't have time to read all these passages, but you can, uh, you can read them on your own. I'm, I'm listing them for you here. In John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus declares that everything was fulfilled. Everything was finished, everything in the law was fulfilled. In Romans chapter six, verse 14, Paul writes that Christians are under the law of grace. So every principle contained in the law concerning man's duty to God and man's duty to other, uh, other men is repeated by Jesus in the New Testament, even the one about man's duty to worship. I mean, the, the Sermon on the Mount contains Jesus' expanded teaching on the law. However, the New Testament reveals to us that the purpose of the law is to reveal sin and, and to lead us to Christ. Paul talks about that extensively in Romans chapter 3, 3 verse 20 in particular, and also in Galatians chapter 3 verse 24. And so once we are in Christ, we are guided by His word. John chapter 12, verse 48, and his word directs us how and when we should worship. We should follow what Jesus and the apostle says about uh, our worship, how we should worship, when we should worship. Those are the ones we listen to. We, we don't listen to Moses about that. We listen to Jesus about that. So we worship God through Christ. And the day that Christ's disciples have been given to gather for worship is Sunday, that's very clear by any cursory study of the New Testament. Another argument um, is that we should observe both the Sabbath and the Lord's Day. There's some people that say, hey, you know, they, they figure, let's, let's, let's cover the entire waterfront. We'll, we'll, we'll worship on Saturday, we'll worship on Sunday. Well, the New Testament makes no mention of the Sabbath in connection with Christ and worship or various observances, you notice that? If you read the New Testament, you'll see that there's never any connection made between the Sabbath and worship uh, in a Christian context. What was done on the Sabbath prior to Christ's coming was done in anticipation of His arrival. Now that He has come and fulfilled all things, there's no longer any religious significance for the things that were formerly done on the Sabbath day. Also, let's not be confused. Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath, if you will. I mean, the Sabbath was until Pentecost. After this, it no longer exists in God's eyes. We need to remember that. Also, they took time to be with God on the Sabbath. Christians have God dwelling with, within them through the Holy Spirit all the time. You see the point I'm making? The Jews took time out of their week on the Sabbath day to be with God. Christians, however, have God dwelling within them 24 hours a day, seven days a week through the Holy Spirit. We don't have to, quote, take time to be with God. He's always, he's always with us. 
and, and the Lord's Day has a different meaning, a different worship, a different purpose than uh, what took place on the Sabbath day. Everything that took place on the Sabbath day was looking forward uh, for what was to come, what was to be fulfilled in the future. Uh, on the Lord's Day, we, we actually don't look to the future. Well, what do we do? We look, we look to the past, don't we? we? We look and remember what has been done for us to give us what we now have in Christ Jesus. And of course, we look forward to the day when we'll be with Jesus uh, in heaven, but that's not the purpose of the, of, the, um, of the Lord's Day, right? The Lord's Day is when believers come together for a witness of Christ, not a, not a day of, of non-work. A lot of people say, oh, you're not allowed to work on Sunday. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that on, on the Lord's Day, Christians gather together in order to remember Jesus by taking the communion. And we learn from the examples and teachings of the apostles that during this time, we also receive teaching from God's word. We enjoy fellowship. Uh, you know, we, uh, we, uh, we provide for the needs of the church and so on and so forth. Those are the things that we uh, gather to do on the Lord's Day. There are no prohibitions about work or anything like that as far as the Lord's Day is concerned, not in the New Testament. Uh, I've not found it. Uh, another argument, <clears throat> if the Sabbath is no longer, do we still have to go to church on Sunday? You know, some people say, hey, we should do the Sabbath and the Lord's Day. Other people say, you know, let's, let's get rid of both of them. Well, there is uh, a command to go to church in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, the Hebrew writer says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the Lord's day uh, doesn't prohibit work, but it does require Christians to witness their faith collectively. It's something that we have to do. Now there are many benefits to this, but the reason is that the word tells us that we need to do this and also what we ought to do. We read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, and in other places in the New Testament where the apostles train and teach the church what they are to do when they gather together uh, to, uh, to worship the Lord. Another uh, argument, uh, how, well, not another argument, but another question is, so how do we keep the spirit of this commandment. The spirit of this commandment is that we must honor God with our time. Remember we said that at the very beginning. Well, we do this honoring God with our time in a variety of ways. For example, uh, a, a time each day where we go into prayer, uh, a time we set aside to read our Bibles each day. That's, that's you know, offering our time to God. Uh, Christian service and benevolence work uh, for those in the church and those in the community. That's, that's offering our time and effort uh, to God. Uh, investing our time in things that are edifying and not destructive. You know, uh, we consume so much destructive stuff you know, online and television and in society. Uh, many times we don't take the time to consume what is edifying spiritually, what will build us up emotionally and, 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 and spiritually. Uh, and when we do this, we are setting aside time, time not only to be with God, but time to do the things of God. And of course, Christian fellowship and recreation. That's also time that we need uh, to be together uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, not just for worship, but for recreation or social activities so that we can encourage each other uh, in, this, in this world. If it seems like a constant sacrifice uh, to do godly things or to be with godly people, then uh, perhaps too much of your time is offered to the gods of this world and not enough in the pursuit of, of things that honor God and that edify um, ourselves uh, in the spirit. Uh, we need to realize that it's not uh, the elder or the preacher that places demands on our time. It is God himself that requires us to offer our time to him. Yes, we offer our money. We put money in the plate on Sunday or we give to good causes, of course. Uh, but God also wants a portion of our time 
uh, to, uh, to be with him so that we can be edified and encouraged in our faith and that we can get to know God on a deeper and more intimate level. And that is very edifying and encouraging when that takes place. Okay, so that's our lesson on the fourth uh, commandment. A uh, couple of questions now that I'll give you that you can, uh, that you can do uh, in your small group discussions. Question number one, what is the perfect Sunday like for you? Question number two, why do you think God requires us to worship Him regularly when the repetitious nature of our worship threatens to become boring? Question number three, did God simply replace Sunday for Saturday or were there any other differences between Old Testament and New Testament worship? Question number four, what part of your time do you tend to hold back from God? 